Hello, all, and welcome to Beyond Belief, where we feature fascinating people of diverse viewpoints striving together for meaning and integrity. So before we get started, please take a moment and hit that subscribe button down there and stay on top of all the great stuff that we offer here at AISH. Um, and our next guest is one of those fascinating people. His name is Professor Uri Maos. He is the assistant professor of computational neuroscience and psychology at Psychology, Crean College of Health and Behavioral Sciences and at Schmidt College of Science and Technology and Fowler School of Engineering and the Institute for Interdisciplinary Brain and Behavioral Sciences, all at Chapman University. Please welcome to the show, Professor Maos. Hello, Thank Professor. Thank you Hi, so much for being here. Me. I mean, your, your bio um, is, that was only a segment of it, and it's uh, obviously quite extensive. You're, you're doing quite a lot at Chapman, but your focus, as I understand it, is on the study of free will, which is our main focus for today. Um, and I can't think of a more critical area of research or topic for contemporary life than that one, and also one of the most fascinating. <clears throat> but to start off, um, I read something in Scientific American that says that 60% of the global population <clears throat> believes in free will. And then I did my own math, and that means that 40% do not. Um, so given that most people feel as if they do have free will, doesn't 40% of people not believing in free will seem like a high percentage to you? Well, I think different people might define free will differently. And I, I, as you assume, I get asked a lot, do you believe in free will? And then I say, well, it depends, of course, on the definition of free will. There's some definitions in which I believe and then others I don't believe. And, I, I, and for me, some, some of those are less a matter of belief, more a matter of do we have scientific evidence for that or not. So I'm not that surprised. It really, uh, you'd have to try to understand what people uh, um, mean when they say free will. And we've done a bit of actually some studies on that. And sometimes people are quite confused. They believe contradicting things when you talk to them about free will. So I'm actually, no, I'm not that surprised that uh, I'm, but I would, although I would have said, if you would have asked me, I would have said that I, I would think that a higher percentage of the population would believe in free will than 60. But if that's what it is, okay. that's what it is. Okay, so so given your general answer to people that it depends on what it is, can you just give us like a, a brief overview of what the, uh, the possibilities are? Right? And I know there's different uh, technical terms for types of free will that people ascribe to, but uh, mm -hmm. what are the options? What does it mean to believe in it? Um, I think the, the, there are two big camps. Of course, as you said, I mean, this is, a, so first of all, we should say about free will, and this is something that philosophers and theologians have been studying for, for millennia. You know, we could spend a year just discussing the background and all the different ideas, but uh, very, very briefly, I think that you could think about free will, or you could emphasize two things when you talk about free will. One camp uh, looks more at this question of, could I have done otherwise? Right. I mean, we we and I think this comes from, let, let's say, this idea of regret. We you know, you do something, you go, oh, if I only would have, you know, if, if only I would have chosen the other thing. And of course, the, the, all these Hollywood movies that go into that, that that chance encounter that that Keep people uh, love those. Yeah, that that door that just opened or didn't open again, the number of movies that, that you know, that, that we've seen. Um, and, and that's about this, uh, like, so can I, could I have done otherwise? That's something that people, uh, um, um, some people emphasize about free will. Other people talk more about the question of control. So um, some things are within my control, other things are not within my control. And uh, so some people, when they talk about the things that are that are are free are more maybe things that are more up to me so then you could think about for instance uh you know if uh, uh i don't know if if 
If you just feel like a cup of coffee in the morning, that's one thing. If you're addicted to caffeine, if you don't have your cup of coffee, you're, you're, your head is going to hurt and your legs are going to shake and whatever. So you're in a different state of control than the person who just maybe has a, an occasional cup of coffee or something. So, so just like the addict is one, one example. So I think those are the two big uh, uh, camps, also intellectually, when talking about uh, uh, free will. Um, Personally, I mean, I have to say, I started out thinking more about this question of could I have done otherwise, but I'm I'm not sure that there is a way to really do otherwise. And I, I tend to think now more in terms of, well, are things under my control or not? I think that's maybe the more important question, but uh, I hope that's that's the kind of level that you were hoping for an answer. Yes, 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 that's good. And so, you know, I hope to explore... The, some of the history and the, and the possibilities and, and of course the implications for the average person, um, uh, what it all means. Um, so given the fact that some people disbelieve in free will and some prominent thinkers and philosophers and scientists, why is it that everybody acts as if we do have it? Even those philosophers and scientists. So for instance, uh, just some, examples I was thinking of, everyone's happy to hear about a marriage proposal, you know, assuming that there's no, you know, negative associations with the people, whatever, you know, um, you know, why isn't that people just shrug their shoulders when somebody proposes and say, oh, the person had no choice but to do that. It was determined from the big, the big bang that they would be getting married. Who, who really cares? Um, or um, something perhaps more profound is, you know, why do we even bother having a court system if, it's all, you know, predetermined that the the criminal was going to commit the crime, and the police were going to arrest them, and and nobody had. It was, we're all just puppets in this uh, closed system, you know. Basically, the question is, what it, what's the societal impact of not believing in free will? Again, and and the and part A of the question was, is why do people act as if everyone acts as if we do? So yeah, I, I once came uh, to give a talk. It was actually at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And uh, the, the professor who was hosting me said, well, I understand you're going to give a talk about free will. That's very strange. I mean, we all know there, there's no free will. W what's there to even talk about? So <laughs> I remember that saying, so let's say, I mean, I, th I think I knew he had kids. So I said, so when your kids act up, do you just not admonish them at all? You just go, well, you know, they didn't have a choice. So of course they can, you know, take the mattress and rip it open and take out the springs <laughs> and so on. And then, you know, I mean, right. th this extreme view of if somebody throws a stone at you, they're as responsible as the stone, right? Because they're both me mechanism mechanisms. Maybe one is more complex than the other. So then, you know, if you put the person in jail, might as well put the stone in the cell next to them or things like that. So I have to say, I mean, some people, kind of vehemently say there is no free will, it's all an illusion, which I mean, the question about the illusion is another thing, but they still then, you know, I don't know, get angry at that company that didn't deliver that stuff on time, uh, <laughs> right. um, be un unhappy if somebody's rude to them. So I, I, I have to say, I don't understand this. I mean, I, I, I can see where people come from saying, I don't think there's free will. And some people even say, well, it's an illusion, but it's such a persistent illusion that even if you don't believe in it, you still it still affects you. And I mean, there are things like that. There are some visual illusions that even if if I explain to you how it's an illusion, you still see it. It's like it's it's you can't well, like a, like a sunset. You know, everyone talks about a sunset, but really there is no sunset. The Earth is just rotating. Yeah, for, for instance, yeah. But I mean, I can tell you, and you can understand. But it still looks like the sun is setting, right? And still, if it's if you're on the beach and the sun is setting, it's still beautiful. But it anyway. <laughs> The, be, it, be it the earth rotating around the sun or, uh, or you know, the earth rotating around its axis or whatever you have. Uh, um, but so I think, um, so you were asking about what are the societal implications. Um, one way to view it is, is this dramatic one where you say, well, if there is no free will, then we don't see uh, a basis for moral responsibility. And uh, um, if that's the case, then, you know, we, we need to open the jails and let everybody out because all these criminals are as responsible as, you know, they're as responsible as the gun, they're as responsible as the axe, as the, the knife, as whatever, their fist. Um, 
but the less, I mean, there are various less dramatic ways to see it. One of them is, I mean, or let, let me actually give another example of what might be, be might be better. I've I actually I get this from time to time. I I get a, an email. It's typically from a, a student. These are like people in their you know early twenties, and they, professor, I just learned from your research, from other research, whatever, that there might not be free will. I've been really distressed. Some people say I haven't been sleeping. I have. I, I I I honestly get these emails. You know, and <laughs> and. I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do. How do I continue with my life? Because if there's no free will, what, what what's the meaning of all of this? So again, these are that, that's, that's a good question. Name. Yeah, foundational questions, and because yeah. um, you know, you sit there and let's say you, you talk about a marriage proposal. You know, you've you're, you're with someone and you're thinking about taking it to the next level, and maybe you know you feel sh should I go to that person and say, hey, should we spend the rest of our lives together? It's you know. But then you go, wait a minute, if it's all been predetermined, then what's the point of me thinking about it? What's the point of me, you know, I mean, it's all been done. So one way that at least I think about that. So if you're worried about that and you're worried about it's all been predetermined or, I mean, in, in, in earlier times people talked about, well, but I mean, it, it's all a God has determined it all, whichever way you want to think about it. Uh, um, it's sometimes called the, the problem of God's prescience, you know, but, but whatever, whatever, whichever way you want to think about it, if it's all been predetermined, then you sitting here and thinking about it has also been predetermined. And if you stop and say, you know what, so I'm just not going to do anything because that's all been predetermined. Well, that has been predetermined as well. Right. You so, can't win. So I just suggest that instead of just finishing every sentence that we say, by the word, and that has been predetermined, we just decide to omit that last part of the sentence and continue on with our life. And of course, that's been predetermined too. Right. Okay. So this this is part of an even bigger question, I think, uh, than just free will. Um, although I think that free will has a lot to do with it, which is, you know, the what for lack of a better term, let's call it a, a materialist worldview. Um, is is one in which a person can walk away and and conceivably conclude that none of this does have any meaning you know uh, exactly as you said we're, we're not particularly different than the stone we're both made of the same electrons and yeah one's a, is a more advanced configuration but you know unfortunately at the end of the day none of this really means anything in which case you know we're sort of locked in this charade this um this this tale that we're telling ourselves you know that doesn't ultimately have any purpose or meaning but we're here and what choice do we have anyway and i and i do think that that is that's the question you know that that's the question and i'm i'm happy to hear that people are distressed by it because at least it means that they're thinking about the import of it um and and so i am hoping that we can talk a little bit now about um different ways of exploring this problem, uh, you're you're you know infinitely more equipped to handle these questions than I am, um, and so this is based on on my paltry research um, into some of these ideas. But I, I'd love to get your take on some of the some famous thinkers um, on free will, starting with Wilder Penfield. Uh, so please correct me if I'm wrong. The the setup for him, as I understand, is that he pioneered stimulating the brain. Um, and what he concluded was that he could get people to move and, and have certain memories and whatnot, but interestingly, he couldn't stimulate agency, meaning they knew that he stimulated them and the thought, you know, it, the thought didn't come from them. And from, again, my understanding is that agency therefore doesn't appear to be connected to all this, that it's some, that's over and above the brain or materialism. Um, uh, one other example is that he discovered that there are no intellectual seizures, so to speak. In other words, when a person has a seizure, they don't do calculus or contemplate justice or anything like that. Like it has to do with involuntary body movements. Um, am I describing this correctly? Uh, and what do you see, uh, if any, as the import of his, some of his discoveries? Well, uh... Penfield, as you said, is one of the fathers of, of neural stimulation. Um, um, and yeah, I, I think this deserves a bit of a longer answer. 
Uh, for, first of all, one thing that's interesting to note is that the brain itself has no pain receptors. So if you anesthetize the skull and let's say drill into somebody's brain and start poking around, the person won't feel that you're poking around. You know, if you touch my hand, I'm going to feel that you're touching my hand. If you cut me, I'm going to, you know, you could you could do bad stuff to somebody's brain as once you're inside the cranium and the person wouldn't, I mean, they might feel the cranium moving or something like that, but they, 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 there are no pain receptors in the brain. Um, now that's sometimes a good thing because say that somebody has a brain tumor and the physicians or the neurosurgeons surgeons need to go in and remove the tumor. Um, so, you're going to damage some tissue in the brain. Uh, there, there are all these things about how we don't use 90% of our brain. It's just not true. Uh, That's good to know. As we know it's well, uh, you want you can jokingly say that people who think that might not, but most of us do. Uh, <laughs> but, but honestly, you know, we do, we use all our brain. It's, 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 uh, evolutionarily it requires so much energy that you would really not want to waste that it just puts stuff there that's not doing anything so anyway we, we do use our brain and you don't want to you don't want to just go in with quote unquote with a spoon and remove the the tumor you know because you're going to damage a lot of things on the way i mean you're going to maybe save the, per the person but then they're going to come out and not be able to speak not be able to move their whatever hand not be able to, and the brain may or may not be able to compensate for that over time so um when doctors go in to remove tumors or sometimes for, for other procedures, um, because there are no pain receptors, they can actually, they can poke electrodes in and say, okay, let's see what happens if I, if I go in this way. And they stimulate that brain area and they see what happens. They see what, what the person does. And for us as scientists, that's always fascinating because then it says something about the function of that brain area. Um, and I mean, Again, Penfield was a long time ago, but there are more recent studies. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, one by an uh, Israeli-American uh, neuroscientist named Yitzhak Fried from 1991. There's another one uh, by a French group. Uh, um, oh, the first one is Desmourget uh, from 2008. Um, and actually, by the way, both of them were able to stimulate some type of, of agency. So let me tell you a little bit about those studies because I think uh, they're, they're interesting. Um, and I'll actually focus on the second one more because uh, the, the first study did a lot of different stimulations and uh, sometimes people talked about an urge to move. So this is uh, actually, so I'm talking now about the, the one from Yitzhak Fried, 1991, uh, Fried and colleagues. And um, under some circumstances when, when uh, a part of the brain called the supplementary motor area or SMA, which is it's around uh, here, uh, was stimulated. It's very close to our motor cortex and it has to do with motor planning and things like that. So when that area was stimulated, people talked about like uh, an urge to move or an intention to move and things of, of that nature. The later paper uh, I think is maybe even more interesting because what they showed was that if you um, if you stimulate what's called the the motor cortex, which is I mean it's around here in the brain, and the left motor cortex control uh, controls my right hand, the right motor cortex controls my left hand. So if you stimulate those areas, people move. They make movements. You can see them, and uh, you can see those movements. They even made some some videos of, of of these patients. You can actually see them, and you ask them, "Did you move?" And the person says. Um, you know, like, no, I didn't move. And then you, you do it again. The person moves again. Did you move? No, no, I didn't move. Um, so that's the motor area. Then there's what's called the parietal cortex, which is a bit more back here. Um, and there are areas there that if you stimulate, then if you stimulate, I mean, you can stimulate it. These are very low voltages, of course, but if you, uh, you stimulate at this very low voltage, the person talks again about this urge to move. I have an urge to move. I want to move my hand. I want to move my leg. I want to move my, my lips. People talk about different things, but I want to move. I want to, if you then stimulate at a higher, uh, uh, higher voltage, then people claim to move. So they just said, I just moved my hand. But, you know, there's a camera on them. They didn't move at all. I should say, by the way, at some point I was working uh, um, 
as a researcher at, at uh, Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, and um, um, we were so the doctors were there, and this was an epilepsy patient. Again, they have to go in to remove the epileptic uh, focus there, the the, the the place where the seizures come from. And um, they, again, want to make sure that they're not going in the wrong way. So they started look, like trying to map where things are in the brain to think how to go in. So this, And then they give this person, they want to map the langu language, so they give this person a, like a list of something to, to read, or I don't know, they were reading off a page. So the person is sitting there, and they have, if I could, try to show how, what it would look like. So they're sitting in there, they're kind of like this. So they can't see their, like underneath, because this, this page is hiding whatever's here. And they're reading something off the page. And then at some point, the simulation goes on, it goes off. And then the person says, yeah, my, my right knee or my right leg just moved, uh, whatever, five inches to the right, you know, whatever, 10 centimeters to the right. And like, it's quiet in the room because his leg didn't move at all. And he realizes that it's quiet. So he moves this and goes, oh! wait, it's in the same place where it was. And then, you know, say, okay, please continue again. And then they do the same thing again. And now he says, he kind of, he catches on. I mean, he says, well, I again feel that my leg moved by however much, but I know it didn't. So yeah, it's still in the same place. So this is, um, um, you can create these desires and you can create situations where people feel that they move. Um, something that I have not seen yet done, it's, I mean, you could put, so theoretically, if you just stimulated one area to make this desire to move, and then the other area to make the movement, you could potentially really put this person like on, uh, you know, uh, like a puppet, there. marionette. This, yeah, my, it, it could be like a puppet on a string or a marionette. Yeah, it's it's I, nobody's done this. I don't know if it can be done, but it seems like from those studies that 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 can be done. So I I, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think that right now, given what we know, we have a reason to think that uh, um, agency is something we cannot stimulate. I should say that there are some experiments that we do here at the Brain Institute at, at Chapman University that also um, um, deal with those things. You could, you don't have to actually invasively go in with an electrode to have somebody move. You could, there's something called a TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulator, and you could, you could do that to the motor cortex and somebody's finger will twitch. It's a very uncomfortable feeling, by the way. It's a bit like when you go to the doctor and they check your reflexes in the knee, you know, they hit you with that stick yeah. and that you're, you're, it feels a bit like that. It's like, it's not me, but then you could, you could be more tricksy. So you could say, okay, whenever you feel like it move. And then when you see that they're about to move by whichever means you, you then stimulate them. And now you ask them, is it you or is it the machine? <clears throat> People get confused. I don't know. I'm not sure if it was me and, and. Then it's so and this is without, of course, going into anybody's brain. This is all from, like, externally done. Sorry, okay. long answer. No, that was a, that was a very thorough and, and good answer and taught me some stuff I that I don't know about. So thank you. Um, and I need to look into it more. Um, one more one more question along these lines, which is uh, Benjamin, I think it's pronounced Libet. Is that correct? Libet. Libet. Yeah. Li Libet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know he's famous. Uh, and I know, uh, tell me if I'm explaining this correctly again, but <clears throat> my understanding is that he discovered that a brain wave comes like a split second before making a free will decision, <clears throat> making it seem as though we don't have free will. Mm -hmm. However, uh, when a person apparently chooses to veto the decision, then there is no brain wave at all, from which I understand he concluded Quote, we met we might not have free will, but we have free won't. Okay, yeah. So that, that that's an interesting study. I would say that it's um, uh, Benjamin Libet's work is perhaps the seminal work of the neuroscience of volition. It was done in the early to mid nineteen uh, eighties, uh, and uh, yeah, let me describe the experiment. I think uh, it's it's interesting. So. The experiment actually, some of it dates back to the 1960s. Uh, 1965, a paper was published by Kornhuber and Dike, two uh, German uh, neuroscientists, who were, they were sitting, I mean, the story goes that they were sitting in, I believe it was the beer garden or something like that, and, and drinking beer, and maybe after one beer too many, one of them said to the other, what actually happens before we move? And it's, I don't know. Nobody knows. And I mean, you have to understand that, right? You know, recording EEG then, or like recording brain waves then, was not like yeah, you connected to the computer, you record it all, you play it back. It was on tape, 
and and people didn't even even know how to uh, how to uh, collect EEG before something. They could do it after because you push play and the machine starts recording. But how do you do something leading up to that? So then they had this idea that well, okay, we'll just ask people to sit there and whenever they want, they were just looking like a, at a blank wall or you know something like that, and whenever they want, they they would make some kind of movement, and we would record the EEG and then we would see when they made the movement and we would kind of play the EEG back to see what happened. So what happened before the movement? And they discovered uh, something that in Germany was called the Bereitschaftspotential, and some people still in English call it Bereitschaft potential. Um, most people now call it the readiness potential. That's, I mean, that's just a literal translation. It means uh, from the German. Um, so they, they discovered something in the brain that seems to happen before we voluntarily move. People got excited about this because this was the first time that, hey, we can look into the brain and, and maybe quote unquote or not quote unquote objectively, see that you're about to move. We can see something there. And even, I mean, later discoveries were, hey, this thing, when you move like non-voluntarily, like when it's a, tw a twitch and, uh, uh, or if it's a reflex or something, we don't see it. Oh, so this now seems to be some kind of signature of voluntary movement. It's not just this any kind of movement. And again, some under some diseases, you don't see it. It, it became more and more this thing of voluntary movement. Uh, Libet, before these 1983 papers, I mean, he's very famous for that, but he was, if I'm not mistaken, he was in his 70s when he did this. He had a long, distinguished career before that. And uh, he was interested in, in questions about uh, consciousness and how does something have to be in the brain for a certain time for you to be conscious of it, or does something you have, you have to see something for a certain time to be conscious? I mean, uh, there's a lot there that he did, um, but he had this this idea to say, well, this readiness potential with the, with the technology at the time, you could see it maybe about half a second before you move, maybe a bit more than that. Now with our technology, we can see this readiness potential even about two seconds, even two and a half seconds before you move. Because I mean, our, our EEG is better, it's cleaner, there's less noise, uh, we can see it. But even then he said, well, if, if I ask people uh, uh, when they decided to move, it would be interesting to see when did they decide to move and when do we see this readiness potential in the brain? So he did a relatively simple experiment. He had people sitting like you and I are sitting here, but he, you know, he, connected, he put an EEG cap on them to measure their electrical brain activity or their brain waves. And he told them, uh, whenever you feel like it, go like this. Just, you know, whenever you feel like it, just kind of twist your, uh, your, your wrist there, flex your wrist. Um, and, but more than that, he had in front of them, he had this kind of like a dot that was moving right. around in a circle. And let's say each, uh, each uh, rotation took, uh, I think it was 2.56 seconds if memory serves, but th the point is it, it moved constantly. You know? And uh, he told you, okay, move whenever you feel like it, but uh, take note of when you first had the urge to move. Where was the clock when you first had the urge to move? So basically it's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a weird experiment, but simple one. You sit there and from time to time you kind of say, okay, I think I feel like moving now. So you move now. And of course, again, you're always looking at that clock and you go, oh, when I had the urge to move, the clock was, I don't know, it. You know, 15 out of 60, whatever, some 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 place in the clock. Of course, so now Libet knows when you had the urge to move and knows when you actually moved. And then so they, they can compute the readiness potential leading up to the movement. And they know when you when you had the urge to move. Now, the interesting result in the Libet experiment that, that, that you alluded to was, well, this readiness potential uh, starts about 500 milliseconds before you move, at least uh, then. This time that you say that you had the urge to move, Libet called it W time for will or want, but uh, this W time is only 200 milliseconds before you move. So now you have a strange situation. Uh, 500 milliseconds or 400 milliseconds before, supposedly if you look into somebody's brain, you know that they're about to move. If you ask them, again, supposedly, they have not reported having had an urge to move. What is going on? Um, and, you know, there was this uh, 
uh, what was it? How, how did it go? The 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 face the, that 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 launched a thousand ships, something like that. So yes, it was that Helen Marlos, of Troy. right? Helen of Troy. So this is the experiment that launched thousands of papers. I think Libet has been cited three, four thousand times. It's it's really a seminal paper, and it's been this experiment has been taken apart. And we're actually, by the way, now writing a, a primer to Libet, and uh, uh, one of the postdocs in the lab is doing that. It's like you could easily write a book about this experiment. It's just so much has been done about it. We were just even just thinking, should we write, should, should we write a paper? Or should we just write a book? Because there's so much to say. But anyway. Um, I'll buy it, by the way. I'll be the, <laughs> the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're writing another book. I can tell you about that later. But okay, uh, okay. I think it's even actually uh, 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 as interesting. But so the. Um, but, I mean, so it's a, it's a fascinating situation here, right? You, you have this situation where supposedly if you ask the person, they tell you, I don't think I've decided to move yet. At least they haven't reported yet moving. Yet you look into their brain, you know they're going to move. So different people took different things from this. Um, one thing that, so Libet uh, in his original paper already said something like, well, it seems that then we begin our movements unconsciously, at least you know, these kinds of movements seem to begin unconsciously because we are not conscious of it, yet we can see it in the brain already happening. Um, later the, later on, and this is just two, two years later already, he, there was another paper where Libet started talking more generally, he said, well, because um, in this paper, it was about, you know, these kinds of flex movements. He said, well, it seems that um, perhaps all movements are started unconsciously. And, and in that paper already he said, well, how does that work with, uh, with you know, re responsibility, with moral responsibility, even with criminal responsibility? If you're not conscious of your movement, then how are you responsible for them? And again, there are actually some, you know, usually these these examples from the law are not very pleasant. But so there's a, there's a, there's this famous uh, case that someone. Uh, um, there was somebody who used to sleepwalk, and he was a known sleepwalker. He would wake up in the middle of the night. You know, he would his wife would find him walking around the house. He would she would not he would not remember what he's doing there. She would put him back in bed. Uh, also, a background here: he had a very good relation with his in laws, and you can probably already see where this is going. But he has very good relations with his in laws. Yet one night, uh, apparently under sleepwalking, he wakes up, drives to the other side of town, takes an axe, and kills his in laws. All I wasn't. I wasn't expecting that, but okay. I wasn't expecting that. I, no, I, so no, that's, I've been, that's too bad. I was. I've been working with lawyers for so long that I always know one of these things is coming when <laughs> they start giving me an example. But anyway, uh, um, or law scholars, I should say, not lawyers. But so th the thing is, this person was acquitted. It, it, there was. Uh, um, it was determined that he had a history of sleepwalking. That he had good relations. He had no no motive to kill his his uh, um, uh, his in laws. And he didn't do this consciously, so he's not guilty. So if we're all doing things unconsciously, then, you know, release us all, right? This goes back to where we started. Right. And people got, uh, I mean, people got quite riled up about Libet's experiment and philosophers, neuroscientists, psychologists, uh, others have, have talked about it a lot. So, I mean, this is just, this is just, uh, uh, to try to explain the experiment again, I'm happy to discuss it more. I just wanted to give well, the just whole that one point. Here. That what's that? That mm -hmm. one point about the veto power. Oh, oh um, right. And my understanding that the uh, that the the 400 milliseconds don't come into play if um, if you cancel out your decision. So yeah, Libet was um, Libet tried. It's the way I understand it, Libet tried to still save free will. He was saying, well, it doesn't seem from this experiment, it seems like our decisions are, are, are made unconsciously. If so, then where is free will? But he said, well, this uh, W time th that we talked about when people say, I, I decided to move, that happens about 200 milliseconds before you move. Now we know that 50 to 80 milliseconds before you move, people sometimes call it the, the, the point of no return. If if you tell me, for instance, if 
if you tell me that moment, stop moving, don't move, it's too late. Like the, the, the brain has already sent the signal. My hand is, my, my muscle has started flexing already. That's it. I can't stop myself from moving anymore. But that still leaves you a bit of time. That's what liver was saying. Between the 200 milliseconds and the, let's say, 80 milliseconds, you still have 120 milliseconds where you could stop. So as you said it, I mean, he said it in a, this kind of uh, a quippy way, right? Like maybe we don't have free will, but we, we have free won't. I could still stop myself. I should say, by the way, interestingly, that one of the reasons that I'm studying free will is there was a, you talked about a Scientific American article. So there was a the Scientific American article that I read in the um, early to mid 90s. And it was something about like, there, we might not have free will, but we have free won't. And that was the first time I've heard about the limit studies and so on. I said, huh, that's interesting. So looking back, this this might have been the thing that led me to where, where I am now. But um, um, there are a lot of problems with the limit experiment. People have made whole careers about criticizing limit. And, and again, it's, it's a very problematic experiment, but it's still a seminal one and in many senses an ingenious one. Um, again, I, we can talk about various problems. No, that's okay. That's okay. What we let's uh, we'll we'll keep going. But I think that uh, I think we've learned. A, I've learned. I'm learning a lot, and I think anyone who watches this is going to walk away with a much greater appreciation for this uh, the density of this topic and um, and the history of it. And hopefully, will be motivated to to research it on their own. Um, yeah, I have a so a couple more questions and maybe a point or two. Um, I saw a video where uh, Professor Michio Kaku uh, claimed that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle um, disproves the idea of us not having free will. Um, that the the lack of determinism has been is is built into the fabric of reality. Heisenberg deter showed that, and therefore, you know, the new Newtonian idea that everything's uh, mechanistic is false. Do you see any bearing, you know, of physics onto your studies? Um, let me start out by saying I'm not a physicist, certainly not a, you know, a fundamental quantum physicist, uh, um, but I can tell you what I've, I mean, I have talked to physicists and I've tried to study this on my own to the best of my abilities. Um, first of all, as far as I understand, there are various interpretations to, uh, to quantum mechanics, some of them suggest uh, that you, you could have a deterministic universe, but then you have other issues. Quantum mechanics is just very weird. And uh, yeah, um, I often actually, uh, as a quick aside, I often get asked, well, does quantum mechanics explain free will? And I I, I, I kind of say, well, this, this seems to come from this idea that we, uh, minimization of mysteries in the universe. So quantum mechanics is weird. Free will is weird. They have to be somehow connected, right? Honestly, I don't think they are, and I'll try to explain why. Um, it, it is true that, so we talked about these two approaches to free will before. One is this idea of, could I have done otherwise? So in a deterministic universe, if everything has been predetermined, then it doesn't seem that there is a, a meaningful way in which you could have done otherwise. Uh, um, if you would have done otherwise, you would have been in a different situation, but you could not. It's, it's just, anyway, it, it, it becomes weird to talk about that, but it's, it's um, so if you, if your view of free will is, is strongly linked to this idea of that I could have done otherwise, then you need for some non-deterministic universe. And some people say, well, um, uh, quantum mechanics gives us this non-deterministic universe. So let's assume for a moment that it does. The issue is that you need more than just a non-deterministic universe because um, a quantum mechanical non-deterministic universe, all that it does is it, it, it throws some kind of cosmic uh, dice every time you make a decision. So let's say, you know, you, you, you walk and you, I don't know, you see a crime happening or let's say you see a car is burning and there's a baby in the car. Now you could do two things, you could try to run over and, uh, you know, save the baby, or you could, uh, hopefully not, but you could take out your cell phone and go, and, you know, uh, go for a good post on some horrible social media. Again, hopefully not. Now, which one of those things you do, we, we'd want to think this is up to you. If you ran in, burnt your hands and saved the baby, we praise you. We go, you know, you're a hero. We, right? And if, if, if there is no, 
free will, then it's maybe, well, maybe you didn't make the decision. But if there is free will and all that happened was some kind of quantum die was thrown and that's what made you run to save the baby, then in what sense are you a hero? You know, the other time it would have been the quantum die would have would have been thrown another way and you would have stayed and, and you know, taken out your phone. So I don't think that's what we want from free will. It's it's perhaps a sufficient condition, but it's uh, sorry, a necessary condition, perhaps for this type of free will, but it's certainly not a sufficient one. That's interesting. Um, in, we, in the remaining few minutes that we have, um, let me read you a quote again from Scientific American, which is very popular today. This is from a, a, a guy named John Horgan, um, who said the following. He said, just as it cannot prove or disprove God's existence, science will never decisively confirm or deny free will. In fact, I might be just a mortal 3D analog version of a speed demonoid, whatever that is, plotting from square to square, my thoughts and actions dictated by hidden, super deterministic rules far beyond my ken. But I can't accept that grim worldview. Without free will, life lacks meaning and hope. Especially in dark times, my faith in free will consoles me and makes me feel less bullied by the deadly game of life. So how do you react to that? And what do you make of his assertion that, that science cannot prove or disprove free will? So again, it depends, of course, on your definition <laughs> as we started. Um, yeah. If, if yes. If what you think is required for free will is a non-deterministic universe, for instance, then that's a question for physicists. It's not a question for neuroscientists. I, I don't know how to do the experiments that would determine, and some people even claim that physicists will, but you know that, that's beyond me. Um, I think that what neuroscience can do is provide a mechanism, meaning we could understand more about like how decisions are made in the brain when decisions go awry, when uh, what happens in the brain of an addict that's different than in the brain of a you know of what you know, healthy person. How does how does an addict potentially make decisions, you know, are, are they less culpable? Um, and things of, of that nature. I think neuroscience can and is helping with those things. Um, I think by the way, um, you could also talk about free will as, as something that's some people think. So if you think about free will more as there, can, can I have done other, could I have done otherwise or not? Then it's an all or none thing. We either have free will or we don't have free will and that's it. Um, I think uh, when you think about it more as a matter of control, you can think about a more nuanced version of free will. We might have more free will or less free will. At least it's some situations. So, um, um, the addict, again, is an example of somebody who has perhaps less uh, free will, maybe even more more generally, but but still do have free will about something. I mean, you can take an analog of like, let's say, if you and I are driving or riding in a car and you're driving, then you have more control over the car than I do. But, you know, but maybe I can still kind of reach over and grab the wheel if something happens. So you could think about like, and somebody who's outside the car has no control whatsoever. So you can think about like degrees of control or something like that. So you could think about degrees of free will, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. you went back to, uh, to that question of, well, you know, without free will, our life is meaningless. Um, so it, again, if you think about free will more of, of a matter of control, and if you think, you know, if somebody becomes addicted to something, then that really diminishes their free will. So maybe the, the idea is not to go and, and see what happens if you smoke that thing again and again and see what, what it's going to do to your brain. Um, and yes, I, I do think that in that sense, your your free will is diminished. But I mean, I don't know if as, as, a, as an addict, that's your worst problem, that this, this existential question about free will. Okay, it's uh, there you have other things. Um, does that, yeah. I, again, I don't know, is, does, is that where you want to go? Yeah, with yeah, no, that, yeah I, uh, I got your reaction and I understand it and, and, and that's good. Um, since we have, a, I see about a minute left, you know, there, there, there's a whole theological angle to this. You know, um, mm -hmm. I come from um, a, a Jewish tradition um, and there is just tons and tons of ink spilled about free will. And obviously there, there is no Judaism with no free will because the entire thing is predicated on the idea that you can make moral choices and, 
and everything written in the Torah is 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 a moral choice, you know, to do this or not do this. And you know, the Torah itself says you should choose life, obviously indicating uh, that you you can do that. You choose life, whatever that ultimately means. But I do think it's interesting just to to note that you know it says in the beginning of the book of Genesis that we are created in the image of God. That's you know one of the more profound things uh, that's stated in in the book of Genesis, and that's interpreted to mean that we have agency, that we have free will. That is the image of God that, that we're discussing. So this, this whole concept of free will is so woven into, into the fabric of, of the theological world, so much so that we're actually asserting that, that like God himself, who is uncaused, that free will too is uncaused. And that's the way that we act in a godly manner by, by, by choosing uh, in, in a moral fashion, and by the way, I think that Judaism would agree with with the scientific assertions that there are many, many ways in which we do not have free will. You know, the from ice cream choices to uh, where we live to um, to to very many things. But when it does come down to a true moral choice, where I have access to do this or access to do this, um, and I make the choice that that actually is uh, doing something, engaging in something transcendental, which I do understand is 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 probably beyond what science is interested in in looking at or discussing um but given that this is a it's a hybrid show um we, you know with a mixed audience i thought it would be instructive to to bring it up and i'll just i'll give you the last word um on that if i'm just curious if you have any feelings or reaction to that uh, as a scientist um i s once spoke to a philosopher who told me in relation to this if you think about it, you'll realize that you cannot choose what you believe. Now, okay. uh, I mean, if I now paid you a million dollars to believe something you don't, you can't, I mean, you really might want to, but again, they're, right. they're famous philosophical, the toxin puzzle and so on. But uh, you, you, so I think there's something that's interesting there that we can't, I mean, we could potentially do things to try to change our beliefs about something, but we can't just stop or start believing something. And I think, I don't know if that relates to what you're saying, but I think that's interesting to know. Me too. Thank you so much, Professor Maus, for uh, being with us on Beyond Belief today. It's been a really interesting conversation and, and fascinating one. Um, and I, uh, I I actually like to, to get the name of that book <laughs> that you're working on later, and maybe we can, just, we can share it with our audience. But uh, in any event, thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on Beyond Belief. And please, once again, hit that subscribe button and stay abreast of all the great stuff that we have coming up. And there is a lot of great stuff coming, so stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching.